<laughs> That's me. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. I'm your host, Simon Severino. And my guest today, Danger, is literally his middle name, an entrepreneur, connoisseur, and raconteur who lives with mountain lions and wolves as house pets. He learned that consistently being the number one top salesperson makes you highly desirable and expendable. Robert is the master of how to make yourself indestructible, and his newest book, Becoming the Boss, launches next spring. Welcome, everybody. Robert Workman. Thank you. I feel very welcome. I'm already having a good time. We haven't even started yet. <laughs> yeah. And we will talk something really relevant, self-belief, self-image, how we keep rolling as entrepreneurs in these very challenging times. That's right. And you know, when I first got our, our discussions going on email, I may have misread some of your pointers. Like, these are the kinds of things we discuss. Check us out. Because I, I thought I read it, the, one of the questions to say, what is the one, and all caps, I just, I visually recall it. What is the one, all caps, O-N-E, uh, asset to an entrepreneur that is most vital to an entrepreneur's success? And I thought, God, I go on and say what I really believe and want to say. I don't know they're going to like it very much because I'm going to say that everybody else that's come on there has been wrong. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is you're an entrepreneur. You are setting up a business or you have built businesses or whatever. I'm sure you'll agree with this. It doesn't matter what skill sets you have in accounting and finance and investor relations and, and uh, building personnel and sales teams and so forth. If you do not have a bulletproof, unshakable understanding of your own self-concept, self-image, and self-belief, if you do not believe in yourself 100% and know why you believe in yourself 100%, you'll fail because there's no way you'll be able to deal with the adversities that will, you'll encounter as an entrepreneur if you do, do not have a bulletproof, unshakable belief that I can do it. I can always do this. So I love this concept and I agree because when we think of entrepreneurism, it's all up and downs. It's a bumpy road and it's many bumps and you have to stand up again. So um, and there are many levels. There are the tactical levels. There are the strategy levels. But the deepest one is the identity. Is I, yourself. Will, <laughs> I will never I will never forget the day when I finished my first short triathlon, it was not a very long mm -hmm. one, but I finished a triathlon. In that moment, something switched inside of myself. I am now a triathlete. The identity uh -huh. is uh -huh. triathlete. And since that day, whenever I had an entrepreneurial problem, oh, look at this, we lost this client, we lost this person, mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to find a new budget for that. I have this identity. I am a tried. I can endure this. I know that I will endure this. Right. It's so neat. Yeah, you have an enhanced sense of confidence from a total different facet or total different direction. But because you accomplished that, that instilled in you a another facet on the diamond of your identity. You know, of yes, I, I can do this. I've done harder things than this. I can do deal with this. I mean, I've had that happen to to the extent where I have failed miserably with that belief in a humorous fashion. I was at a friend's house, dinner party, long 25 words or less, dinner party. We were out smoking cigars by his pool uh, and having a drink and so forth before the dinner party went in. I had forgotten all my stuff out there and, and gone inside. And I wanted to have a cigar. So <laughs> it was December, freezing cold. And I went out and they had a railing around the pool and I'm having fun, I'm partying, I'm swinging on the railing, walking around the pool, going to get my cigar and drink. Well, the railing had not been firmly attached all the way around. So here I am just swinging over the water because it's fun, I'm swinging over the water and then the railing comes off. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> wait a minute, I can get out of this, I know I can get out of this. I always get out of these things. I'm Bob Workman, I can get out of this. 
splash. <laughs> I went six feet under in freezing water. <laughs> it didn't bail me out that time. <laughs> yeah, it must be backed by by reality. But, but that <laughs> that is that is the ingrained belief that I have. Even this ridiculous, stupid circumstance I'm in, I'm thinking of a way to deal with it and get out of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it only works if it's backed by reality. So even today, yeah. we had minus, minus, minus 10 uh, Celsius out here in the morning, but 6.30, I go running. And, mm -hmm. uh, and some people might think, why, why does he go running when it's so cold or when it's, when it's raining or whatever? It's because otherwise I cannot sustain this identity. Otherwise, it's just not true. And if it's mm -hmm. not true, you will not believe it. And if, if, and if you don't believe it, then when the next problem comes, the next project, the next client situation, mm -hmm. then I will go, uh, I can endure that, I guess, mostly. And that's a f different energy. Yes, yes, it sure is. It sure is. And you, because you've completed that, because you know you've done that, you know you can, you know you will. It's just, it exerts that discipline. But uh, I'll never forget, I, I ran track uh, all through school in college and so forth. And I remember early, like high school or something, I told my dad I was running a race. It really hurt. And I felt like quitting. But I didn't, but I felt like quitting. I just, oh God, I just don't want to keep going. And I remember he said, he was a cross country runner. He said, never, ever quit. He said, if you quit one time, it makes it a lot easier to quit again. And then it gets a lot easier to quit again. He said, just don't ever quit. Just keep going. And, you know, little tidbits like that. But that's what we do. I, I do. I, if I work with a group, a uh, company or something, I, I help the, those people understand in writing. I make them work. I, I don't do much work. I sit up there and talk. They, then I make them write. And they write their identity. And they write how they're doing compared to how they should be doing in their own mind in the various roles that surround that identity. So every, day, every time you take this identity or person or this picture of yourself into a relationship with someone else, that's a new role. You have a role as a mate, parent, you have a social role out there, you have a job, you have you contribute to company profits, you grow yourself as a leader, you have respect from people. So we measure these and then we have them work in all those general roles, but it's all affected by, by your identity. If your identity on a scale of 10 is five, you can only put 50% of what, what you really have as potential into anything. So we try to increase people from a self image of five or six or seven to eight, nine, 10. And when they do that, all of a sudden you have a brand new employee. You have somebody who really commits to work, who looks forward to it, who believes in it and believes in themselves doing a better job. Now they're more productive because they believe in themselves and they put more into everything they do. So that's the long and short of that. That's powerful. And uh, I want to hear every detail about this. How, how do you create this? deep transformation. But first, one word from our sponsors. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. So tell me, who, who is the ideal candidate to work with you and how does the journey start? You know, it is. That's a fascinating question because I've done workshops half day workshop. I mean, it is a workshop. They, like I say, they write a lot. Um, but I've had it where the, the CEO who commissioned me participated because I just suggested, I think you'd want to be in there too. And some executives and, and people in production and people in sales. I've done it for a whole company of like 20 people as a cross section. And sometimes the person who comes up to me afterward and says, I just want to tell you, this has been the most rewarding experience and so on and so forth is the CEO, is the boss. Sometimes it's somebody in production. You, you don't know what nerves you touch or who you really reach. But here's this boss who's committed his whole life to building this business ultra successful, but maybe all of a sudden now for the first time, because I've had him sit down and analyze how he's doing as a mate, how he's doing as a parent. That's maybe the first time he ever sat down and really put it to writing and ever thought about it. And sometimes they come up and just say, I was about to lose those last two circles, you know, because <laughs> I put so much into the job role. So 
really have to be, it's basic. You know, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm a guy who's been in sales for 40 years. I probably know more about psychology than most psychologists, but it's, it's powerful because we, we provide four pages of 140 words that are all positive words. So they can choose, so we can start programming their thinking by choosing where I am this, or I'd like to become this. And then we distill that down. And then by the time we've distilled it down through other written exercises, now here's a blank sheet of paper, write your identity. Who are you? If you had an elevator pitch for you, not your company, not your job. If you're in an elevator, somebody says, who are you? I don't want to hear that I'm a salesman for IBM. I don't want to hear I've built three companies. I want to hear who are you? Do you really know how to answer that question? We have an elevator pitch for everything else in our lives. How about one for us? So I have them distill all that down into their elevator pitch for who they are as a human being. And now, and that's just the beginning. I said, now, Hemingway said, writing is rewriting what you've already rewritten. So that's the first time you've done it. So now you're going to do this a lot. After we leave here, I want you to look at that, embellish it, take that one or two or three sentences, make it a paragraph, make it a page, write a book about yourself because it's the only time you'll ever pay attention to you in this manner. So. I like it. Writing is rewriting what you have already yeah. rewritten. It's, it's true. Life, oh, that is true. Is that not true? <laughs> life is curation more than really invention. It is curation uh -huh. of what is here and uh, picking, yeah. picking mm -hmm. the most important. Yeah. And then, then we try to, it, to show them maybe things they haven't thought about. Like we try to focus on, okay, here are these different groups of people and how they behave. Let's look at the very top, most successful group, 3% of the people in our society. Uh, let's look at how they look at goals. Well, those people have written specific goals. Other people have generally in mind goals. Other people have New Year's resolution. But your leader has written specific goals problems. These are problem seekers. They try to figure out what's going to go wrong in the future so they can deal with it now so it doesn't happen, as opposed to people who are problem solvers. Very good people. Problem seekers says, I see this coming up. I hired a problem solver. I'll give it to him. He'll take care of it. Need, they, they have a high need for power. They take calculated risks. They predict the future. Entrepreneurs predict the future. You know, people who work for entrepreneurs work for their future. And, and people who just kind of punch a clock and go home and very good workers, but they're just really there to do their job and go home. They can't wait for the future. It's like someday, honey, my boat will come in, you know, but it never does. Um, and the funny thing I say is if you want to tell <laughs> a, who a person is in their character, just look at where they take a vacation. The top 3% take a world vacation. Doesn't mean they're rich. This is not a social economic scale. This is a social economic scale. I have friends who take world vacations. They don't have money, but they figure out a way to save all year and go someplace. That's their idea. They want to take it. They have a vast 30,000 foot elevation, even if they're not a CEO. And then other people take a national vacation. They just know, you know, I'm, I, I see myself going around the country, but I don't see myself globetrotting. And then other people take a 150 mile vacation. That means all, they, they finally saved up enough money to buy the lake house. And now they bought the lake house. And you know where every vacation is going to be spent now that they have the lake house. It's 75 miles out, 75 miles back. And that's where they go for their vacation. It's just I, I try to help people understand if you change these little habits, just this one little bit, you, instead of thinking about your goals, how about setting some written specific goals? Instead of solving problems as they come up, how about thinking of them downstream? And anyway, we just do a lot of self-improvement work. I'm curious, you can pick only one person when everybody's zigging, this person is zagging, and you give the person the strategy award. Who do you nominate? Mickey Spillane. Unfortunately, he's dead. I would interview two people, Mickey Spillane and Og Mandino. One for fiction, one for nonfiction. Yeah. I mean, Mickey Spillane had concise, concise use of language. And, and you knew right where you were at when you were reading any of his books. Matter of fact, when he wrote in the late 50s and in the, in the 40s, he invent, basically made paperbacks work. He, of the top 10 selling books in America at the time, he wrote the top seven, number one through seven. They were his first seven books. <laughs> But uh, I, had, I, I got to know him. I had lunch with him. And the funniest thing, I'll give you a quote. This is a quote from me, hearsay to you, but... I'm sitting there having lunch with Mickey Spillane. I'm talking about writers and use of language and concise and directed. 
And I talked about Hemingway. He said, you know, it's funny about Hemingway. He never liked me very much because I sold more books than he did. <laughs> now, tell me the number of people in the world who can say that and pull it off. <laughs> you can count about three of them. <laughs> I love a guy like that. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> What are the three books that influenced you most? You know, early, early in my life, as I was learning about business out of academia, now I've got to make a living and I'm going to be a sales guy, I guess. The Achieving Society by Dr. Um, David McClellan. Mm -hmm. Dr. David McClellan was uh, chairman of the psychology department at Harvard. And he wrote a book called The Achieving Society. And in The Achieving Society is where he kind of differentiated a lot of the things that I just rattled off a few minutes ago. Uh, it's a it's a well, here it is. I, I, I'm kind of going through it. This one and this one, I'm kind of rereading. You know, you go back and you want to flip through and catch up some things. Maybe you forgot and certain books that were influential, like Think Grow Rich. Well, anyway, The Achieving Society is a great book, but. It is not an easy read. It is an academic book, but he talked, basically, if you want to know anything about human needs and acquisitions, read The Achieving Society. I feel like I, if there's one thing I'm an expert on, it's human needs and acquisitions and how to predict human behavior. So, and the other, another one, fairly new, is uh, Blink by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I love Blink. If you like Westerns and old, old gunfighters and who's the fastest and who knows what's going on, this tells you why. Uh, this analyzes how if you really know what you know, if you really are an expert at what you do, you can tell in two seconds things that other people can do studies and have reams of data and be wrong, and you can disagree with them, and you're right. And he goes through case by case by case in here, like the Getty Museum paid thirty mil ten million dollars for this sculpture, and they had all the data that said it was it was authentic and ancient uh, Greek uh, kuros. Well, it wasn't. They had experts come in. They said, "You haven't bought that yet, have you? Why? And it's fake. No, we've got all this data and we got all this proof and all this evidence. And, okay, go ahead, but I'm telling you, it's fake. And then one after another after another, all did the same thing. They just looked at it and they knew. I, I love that kind of instantaneous confidence in your thinking. So that one. <laughs> so you got Achieving Society and Blink. And you know what? The, great, the Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Van Dino, when I was learning to sell. I don't know that it taught me much about sales, but sure taught me how to be a good human being and be offering a, a real valuable service as a salesperson and therefore to become successful, if you know what I mean. So I would say those three nonfiction, but I got to say, I, the jury by Mickey Splain changed my life <laughs> when I was 18. I learned about de friendship, loyalty, commitment, determination, and most of all, singleness of purpose. All those translate to business, but I learned them from that goofy fiction crime novel. So. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm really touched by the blink part where you say, mm. Expert recognizes the pattern mm -hmm. immediately. Now, some people attribute this to intuition. Others say, no, it's thousands of thousands of time of slow pattern analysis and slow pattern recognition. And when you have done it 10,000 times, then it's quick. Uh, in which school do you, do you belong to? Well, and what he says is it's not intuition. It's instinct. And let, he says, let me tell you what instinct is. And instinct is the latter. Instinct is, yes, you've got so much information in your mind. You have no idea how much information you contain back there and how fast it's processing. And so without even thinking, without knowing why you know this is fake or you know this is a good idea, you just know that it is. You know, without without even thinking, you know, that's a bad guy. Now, I can say, so, let me tell, I'll tell you why that is. I have a document. I would tell your guys, people, look this up online. This is an article that will blow your mind. It is called In the Blink of an Eye. 
and it's from MIT News. Yeah, That's a few years, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. And I was so ecstatic. I don't even know how I ran across it. But when I ran across it, I had a party that night. I said, friends, we're going, I, uh, three or four friends, let's go buy, I'm buying drinks. Because I'd been telling people this for 40 years, speaking to groups, working with groups, motivating groups, changing behavior. But I didn't have any actual evidence to back me up. This is evidence. In the blink of an eye is an article about the fact that is clinically measured at MIT by their best, fastest computers. How fast does the human mind comprehend an image? It is 13 milliseconds, 13 thousandths of one second. Now, do the math. If you do the math at 13 thousandths of a second per image, we're taking in 46,160 images a minute. You're taking in 46,000 images a minute. And at 46,000 images a minute, you can tell walking down the street. Do I want to look the person in the eye? Do I want to smile? Do I want to look away? Do I want to shake hands? Little things like that. But we're doing that all day long. We're processing all this information. And frankly, that's why I, I tell people to tune out of the media at least before they start their day. I don't watch, I don't, we're having an inauguration today. I, have I turned on the TV, the news or the radio? No. Better not. Because, no, because I choose to get depressed about nine o'clock at night. And that's when I go pick up what I, what happened for the day. Cause I know between nine and 10, okay, I'll devote an hour of my life to getting depressed, keeping up with current events. Then I still got a couple hours before I go to bed. I can read a book, watch a sitcom and bring myself back up. Because all I'm going to see during that hour, I guarantee you, is alcohol, drugs, murder, rape, terrorism, theft, war, and politics. None of which makes me happy. But it's immediately followed by a product advertisement that makes me feel good. So I, I go buy the product to make me feel good because the news makes me feel so horrible. Alcohol, drugs, murder, rape, terrorism, theft, and war, bat battered into your head at 46,000 images a minute. If you do that every morning, you know, first thing a person does in the morning, turn on TV set. What's on the TV? All that garbage. Go downstairs, have breakfast, newspaper, online, a phone, all that same garbage. Get in the car, turn on the radio, all that same garbage. By the time they get to work, they've heard this stuff. They've been bombarded at 46,000 images a minute with all this bad news and negativity. Shut it. I just shut it off, you know. I decided yesterday that I will stop watching MSNBC to see how the capital situation is going and the inauguration and that I will uh -huh. I will prefer to sleep well because it's not yeah. in my control anyways. If they have 20 right. guns or 200 guns, these stupid people there, uh, right. it's not in my control. I cannot change it. And right. I prefer to sleep well and the next day to write 600 words more. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, yeah. Moi aussi, mon ami. <laughs> and no, I, I had a friend. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Because you 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 quoted uh, Hemingway a couple of times, and he is really my 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 benchmark and my idol in terms of just showing up to work. Pick mm -hmm. your one thing that yeah. you want to create, and then do it every day. And you know, I learned my writing my writing modus operandi by what I learned about Hemingway. I've always written, now I'm old, I gotta sit down. I've always worked and written all my life standing up. He wrote standing up. He went to work eight hours a day. He would go to work at nine, he'd write till five. That was his job. So I made writing, when I'm writing something, you know, passionately involved, it's my job. I start writing at nine, I work till five. I write standing up. And I just learned a lot of that from that work ethic that he self-imposed because you're right, it works. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, you, you feel it in, in every sentence. And, uh, and sometimes he was asked about his method and he, he, he always went back to these routines and his habit of just when he starts, when he ends, and that he tries to have always a little bit of fuel in the tank. He mm -hmm. never depletes everything. Because right. next time he wants to to come in ready. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, uh, the the writing and rewriting. I what, uh, just off the top of my head, I cannot remember the title of the book. One of his great books. 
he said in an interview that he had written the la rewritten the last page 39 times the last page 39 times 39 times and they, and you know, like why 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 was that necessary why did you do that he said i was getting the words right wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know, I'm mentoring a guy and he's a great guy and I love working with him. And he's really got so much determination and drive. But the funniest thing happened the other day. I'll, I'll have him over and we'll talk about this business question, this business question. What about this idea? Do you think I should? And one day he said, you know, Bob, I got to tell you, sometimes I think I learn more from you by the stuff you tell me when you're not teaching me something. <laughs> And I think little tidbits like that, we learn so much from those things. They this, stay with us. Yeah, this is a masterful writer talking here. Mm -hmm. I have just started my first chapter. I have my first book deal right now in London, and I have started. Congratulations. My first, thanks. And uh, I have started last week to because I have deadlines now for every chapter. I am writing the first chapter. And I tell you what, after three days of writing, I can already not see my work anymore because I saw it three times. It, it's already boring. Uh, and I have to revisit it 16 times, maybe 39 times. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I, I, another thing I learned, now I don't know if this is really true about him, but I believe it is. So in my head it is. But he also, you know, he rewrote a lot. So apparently I thought he would write before, if he's writing his novel and he's uh, left off at page 56, before he starts page 57, he reads one through 56 and edits it. And, and that gives him like momentum to run into page 57 and following. So by the time he's gotten to page 100, those pages have been edited God knows how many times. And that's the way I do write. It, it, as I write and the book develops, it takes a lot longer to, to write those last chapters <laughs> because I, I do dance as I get longer in. I, I read through, but it, it really does help you tighten it up. It really does. So again, just little things and work habits that you learn from people who are successful. And that's what I tell people, learn from the masters. You know, if you go to a library, it's all free as the greatest things ever written and contributed to society sitting at your fingertips. People say that experience is the best teacher. Experience is the worst teacher of all. Go to a library, get a book or read a tape or watch a video about somebody who's been successful at what you're thinking about doing because they'll tell you all the ways they've already blown it. You won't have to blow it yourself. They've already done it. You can avoid all those things and, and learn how they did it successfully. On, without having to learn those things experientially on your own. Yeah. So next spring, your new books, your new book comes out, and mm -hmm. uh, how how do you plan to promote it? Becoming the boss. How will you promote it without book tours? Ah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I decided about a year ago that I was just tired of traveling, tired of speaking, just before all this COVID thing hit. I was just tired of traveling, tired of speaking, and I, I didn't want to do it that much. I like my books out there, and I'm just pulling back. And and then when COVID hit, all of a sudden, now I'm doing online webinars left and right. I'm speaking more than I was speaking then, but I'm doing it from right here. I go downstairs, get a cup of coffee, come up, and I get to visit with you. But I didn't have to fly to Paris to do it. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm really enjoying the ability to have more contact with people, albeit electronic instead of in person, which I miss because I'm a sales guy. I like face to face. But um, it's it's actually been fun for me because I, I'm doing a lot that I want to do without having to deal with an old guy and all the physical stress. So Beautiful. I'm an old guy with physical stress, but I still play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and um, where can people stay in your orbit and subscribe to to see more of you? Yeah, you know, I, I do write a weekly blog, and uh, it's sales strictly sales and business, and it's called Gonzo Selling because it's ways that I've learned to be successful that nobody else is ever going to tell you how to do it. Um, 
and it's called gonzoselling.com. But my website to sign up for the blog and to see other things that we have available to help is simply hiredgun.us. And you can email me simply, it's robert at hiredgun.us. And I answer every email. I answer every email I get. Maybe not that day, but I do answer every email I get. And I love to be of help to people. I mean, if you have a, a question or a problem in business, send it to me. If I don't know the answer, I'll find somebody who does. Beautiful. And Robert, who should be my next guest? Oh, my goodness. Your next guest should be a guy named Mitch Russo. Oh, Mitch. Cool. I was on, you know his, Mitch? I was on his podcast last week, I think. I was on his podcast. I love Mitch Russo. I have worked with Mitch. These headphones I have on, Mitch was coaching me. I said, Mitch, no, I've got this great microphone. I've got these great cost professional ceramic head. He said, Bob, just Bob. 40 bucks, get these headphones. They're $500. They do blah, 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 blah. He was right. He's always right. Bob, you need a different logo. It needs to be a little more user for how about this idea? He was right. Mitch is always right. Mitch knows everything he's talking about. So if he walked into my website or my business, he would be blinking about 50 times and saying, Bob, change that. Bob, that's no. <laughs> So if you could possibly get him on your show, he would be an outstanding guest. Beautiful. Yes, Mitch is a rock star. I like him a lot. Yeah. I work on his yeah. show. We are in a mastermind together. And, ah, uh, great. and uh, he, he was the CEO of, of one of the Tony Robbins companies. Right. He wrote a book and that I'm I reading right now, a wonderful book about how to create and implement the business model of certifying other people that do your work. So right, the yeah. Model. And I, I have certified strategies, print coaches, and that's exactly the model that I run. And so he gave me his book. He said, Simon, you will like this book. And I love it. I love every page of it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when you find one like that. Yeah. Now, have you? is, is it full of notes and handwriting and underlines? Because when uh, I read a when I get a good nonfiction book and it's helpful to me, I'll show you. I'll fan through it and I'll say, "Now you can tell I read this book." And it's just ripped apart, written in, and underlined and highlighted. Yes, <laughs> the, I, I'm reading the Kindle version, but it's full of highlights. Everything yeah. <laughs> yeah. marks absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Now, all I'd have to do is see that. You know, you could say, "I like this book," and you'd show it to me there, and I would know. Yes, he really likes this book. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you. I will contact Mitch and we will make this happen. Very great idea. Sure. So, thank you, Bob, for being on thank the you. show, sharing your wisdom, your knowledge with us. And please come back soon. Oh, uh, I would love to come back and, and talk more. We can talk about different things, too. And if I, I just like to be of help. It's so much fun that way. And uh, I would love to reappear and... Thank you for having me on. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. I hope something that I said might have been of help to somebody. Absolutely. Thank you so much and keep rolling. Okay. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double your revenue in 90 days.